world to welcome you to a very special event and the Creative Writing Reading Series featuring two of my very favorite poets and people. This reading is sponsored by the Georgia Poetry Circuit and the Georgia Poets Initiative. This year, celebrating 35 years of continuous service, the GPC is the oldest statewide poetry consortium in the U.S. and has brought to audiences across the state hundreds of free readings by nationally honored poets. Barry has proudly served as a flagship institution and housed the GPC since 2007. This year, the Barry Creative Writing Program is celebrating the Year of the Alum, welcoming alumni back to campus throughout the year for a variety of events. It is my honor tonight to introduce to you Barry alumna, Avery James, who in turn will be introducing tonight's poet, Jericho Brown. Avery James is a first-year MFA student at Georgia College and State University with a concentration in poetry. As a recent graduate of Berry College, she tells me that she's excited to be back to introduce one of the people integral to her choice to pursue writing. She now perceives poetry not only as a passion, but as a medium to explore the complication and marvel of the human condition and how we connect because of and despite our differences. Her experience at Barry has encouraged her to continuously find ways to integrate her passion for service with art. In her time here, Avery says, it was the fierce, relentless support of her mentors and friends that pushed her to achieve two state championships and semi-national finals in forensic speech and debate. She has been recognized with such awards as the Academy of American Poets Award, the Hammond Poetry Award, the Gordon Barber Poetry Award, and the Eleanor B. North Creative Writing Portfolio Award. As a staunch social advocate for marginalized populations, Avery is always looking for chances to return to the communities that have fostered her into the person she is and hopes to become. My first encounter with Avery was when I served as one of the judges for a poetry slam she participated in as a first-year student at Barry. To say she was the clear winner would be an understatement. After Avery's performance, the feeling in the room was more, what the heck just happened? <laughs> the piece she had written, her embodiment of it, was extraordinary, yes, but her work in the following years just kept getting better. So much so that in her senior year, I invited her and another star poetry student, Kathleen Minor, to give a public reading with an outstanding visiting poet, Adrian Matika, a finalist for both the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. Watching Adrian as he listened to Avery read, seeing him hear her work for the first time, I recognized the look on his face as I had felt it on my own. She killed it. Since her graduation, it has been my honor to solicit and publish her work in the Phi Kappa Phi Forum, the flagship publication of the Phi Kappa Phi Honor Society. And this is just the beginning. I can't wait to see what she'll do next. And it's truly my pleasure to ask you now to please welcome Avery James, back to Barry. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming out today. And it is an absolute delight and privilege to announce and introduce a poet whose work, through narrative and technical skill, inspires earnest, passionate, and unapologetic engagement in our culture. Jericho Brown is the winner of the Whiting Writers Award and a recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, the Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Study at Harvard, and the Guggenheim Foundation. He is the author of three books of poems, Please, which won the American Book Award, The New Testament, which won the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, and most recently, The Tradition, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. His poems have appeared 
in the New Yorker, Fence, the New Republic, the New York Times, the Paris Review, Time Magazine, and several volumes of the, Bar the best American collection. He is the Winship Distinguished Research Professor in Creative Writing and Director of Creative Writing Program at Tempo. <laughs> In the tradition, Brown introduces his inventive form, the duplex, which can be described as an excavation of the sonnet, the hustle, and the blues. From the combined elements, Brown has created a verse that concentrates their essential powers of moving the spirit through rhythm, echo, and clever brevity. This new form is a testament to the value of poetry and how it honors the constant evolution of language by challenging and reinvigorating our relationship with language. Brown writes in his poem, Virus. I can't kill the pansies, but I want to do the killing. I want you to heed that I am still here, just beneath your skin and in each organ, the way anger dwells in a man who studies the history of his nation. The tradition is as much a celebration of love, identity, and the body as it is a confrontation of our cultural fears, tackling subjects such as police brutality, gun violence, sexual assault, and racism without restraint. However, Brown is sure to remind his readers to sustain optimism for the future, as seen in his third duplex, In the Dream Where I Am an Island, I Grow Deep with Hope. I'd like to end there. His concern and tenderness for our increasingly turbulent world and others sings as much through his writing as it does his actions. When I first met Jericho Brown three years ago, and someone told him I write, he asked if he could see one of my poems. And being shy because it's Jericho Brown, I told him I didn't have anything on me, which I told him did, but I lied because it's Jericho Brown. <laughs> <laughs> but as the day came on into evening, and he insisted to keep seeing my work, I realized that in the, his enthusiasm that he radiated, there was a promise of safety and genuine interest. I'll never forget the cool little nod he gave me he said, as he said, Keep doing what you're doing. And here I am, and I'm doing it. Um, I'd say, I say this because his encouragement that day pushed me to further explore the value of poetry. And he carries that same energy in his own work, making it a sustaining force and an instrument of political conversation. I'll always be thankful for his writing and his spirit. And with that, it is my honor, pleasure, and privilege to introduce one of my inspirations, Jericho Brown. I'll try it. It was really interesting because I never heard so many introductions in one night. I just feel like I feel bad because I don't have anybody to introduce. I really felt like I should get up here while I was here. And I was like, this is so nice. I should introduce somebody. And I was thinking, oh, I'll just introduce Mary. But then I was like, she'll be so angry. <laughs> Jericho, read your poems. Uh, which I'm going to do, I promise you, I'm going to read my poems. I swear. Um, just really, the, 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 thank you always to uh, to Dr. Sandra Um uh, Thank you um, to this wonderful faculty. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Will. Thank you for the introduction, Avery. Uh, and thank you to all the students who I met here. Met with here today. I met with three different classes during the day who um, who were completely invigorated and alive and who were engaged with poetry and with literature. So good. Can I say just this thing? I love talking with young people about writing, but I love, you know, the younger you are, the more you have a 100% understanding that writing really is about that which happens in our daily life. And I really appreciate coming uh, to Barry because I'm always coming across these students who want to talk to me about uh, that which is in the poetry in terms of its craft, but also how it touches on something as simple as our love for waffles or pancakes, as well as that which is political, or that which is erotic, or that which is um, deep in us and is faithful or spiritual. And so I really appreciate all those conversations that we had today. Thank you all so much for allowing me the opportunity to have them. 
Uh, where I'm from, we always begin with prayer. So, prayer of the backhanded, not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the boomstick, nor the closest extension cord, not his braided belt, but God bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather, eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimpled cheek, unworthy of its unfisted print, and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand, hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target, like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best meetings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy, calling it love. God, save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury, whether or not his son stands near. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw as I think to say, excuse me. Much of what I do with my poems is I make the attempt to reclaim or, or remember um, much of the, the language that I heard as a kid growing up. We talked about that a little bit about Southern vernacular um, and me trying to make use of what I think of as, as Southern vernacular and Black Southern vernacular in particular in my poems. Uh, the title of this next poem might be a phrase that you that y'all don't know. It's uh, I think a very much a Louisiana phrase. Uh, and if you don't know what the phrase means. It'll, it'll become clear, I think, when I read the poem. <coughs> Four in the morning. Are you a person? <laughs> Big person? Are they afraid? <laughs> is it a real person? Yeah. What is she thinking? She's thinking? <laughs> she should call me Fanny. <laughs> Maybe she did. No, it was not. <laughs> in the morning. My mother grew morning glories that spilled onto the walkway toward her porch because she was a woman with land who showed as much by giving it color. She told me I could have whatever I worked for. That means she was an American. But she'd say it was because she believed in God. I am ashamed of America and confounded by God. I thank God for my citizenship in spite of the timer set on my life to write these words. I love my mother. I love black women who plant flowers as sheepish as their sons. By the time the blooms unfurl themselves for a few hours of light, the women who tend them are already at work. Blue, I'll never know who started the lie that we are lazy, but I'd love to wake that bastard up at 40 in the morning, toss him in a truck, and drive him under God past every bus stop in America to see all those black folk waiting to go work for whatever they want. A house, a boy to keep the lawn cut, some color in the yard? My God, we leave things green. Labor. I spent what light Saturday sent sweating and learned to cuss cutting grass for women kind enough to say they couldn't tell the damn difference between their mowed lawns and their vacuumed carpets just before handing over a $5 bill rolled tight. 
hide it in a joint and asking me in to change a few light bulbs. I called those women old because they wouldn't move out of a chair without my help, a walk without a hand at the base of their backs. I called them old and they must have been. They're all dead now, dead in the earth I once tended. The loneliest people have the earth to love and not one friend their own age, only mothers to baby them and big sisters to boss them around. Women, you wanted to please and pray for the chance to say please to. I don't do that kind of work anymore. My job is to look at the childhood I hated and say I once had something to do with my hand. This next poem is, uh, in many ways, what we might call a found poem. This poem is completely made up of sentences that I heard as a kid growing up in the neighborhood where I grew up. Um, and so this is a poem that I always think is a, a really good representation of just how I grew up. I think you'll find out just what that neighborhood was like and just what my friends and the other people, uh, what our neighbors were like, my family, what we were like when I was growing up. Um, so all of these sentences are sentences that I overheard other people saying when I was a kid. And, um, you know, I like to think that they're just my sentences, the sentences I heard growing up. And I think uh, they, they might be sentences that some of you recognize, too. Autobiography. Keep the line steady. Keep your back straight. Keep coming back for more. Keep fucking with me, Cletus. Keep putting your hands on me like that. And you'll always have a place to lay your head. Keep my waistline down. Keep your figure up. Keep your man happy. Keep a woman crazy. Keep your daddy off your mama or next time I'm calling the police. Keep these nappy-headed children off my green, green grass. Keep talking smart if you want to. Keep looking at my man and I'll cut you a new eyelid. Keep looking me in my face when you tell your next lie. Keep on walking, I ain't talking to you anymore. Keep holding that last note. Keep singing while I get the splinter out. Keep singing for Jesus, baby, and everything will be all right. Keep me in your prayers. Keep us in your thoughts. Keep your eyes on the black one. He ain't got no sense. Keep your money in your pocket, Nelson. These hoes giving it away. Keep this one occupied. I'll get his wallet. Keep on living, honey, and you'll get old too. And as all of you know, poets uh, poets can't seem to get enough of Greek myth. <laughs> So there's a little bit of the absolute poem. And maybe, um, maybe this is just a poem about war. There seems to me some, some of World War I and World War II and Vietnam in this poem as well. Hero. She never knew one of us from another. So my brothers and I grew up fighting over our mother's mind. Like sun colored suitors in a Greek myth, we were willing to do evil. We kept chocolate around our mouths. The last of her mother's lot, she cried at funerals, cried when she whipped me. She whipped me daily. I am most interested in people who declare gratitude for their childhood beatings. None of them took what my mother gave, waking us for school with sharp slaps to our bare thighs. That side of the family is darker. I should be grateful, so I will be. No one on earth knows how many abortions happened before a woman risked her freedom by giving that risk a name, by taking it to breast. I don't know why I am alive now that I still cannot impress the woman who whipped me into being. I turned my mother into a grandmother. She thanks me by kissing my sons. Gratitude is black, 
black as a hero returning from war to a country that banked on his death. Thank God, it can't get much darker than that. As a human being, there is the happiness you have and the happiness you deserve. They sit apart from each other, the way you and your mother sat on opposite ends of the sofa after an ambulance came to take your father away. Some good doctor will stitch him up, and soon an aunt will arrive to drive your mother to the hospital, where she will settle next to him forever, as promised. She holds the arm of her seat as if she could fall as if it is the only sturdy thing, and it is, since you've done what you always wanted. You fought your father and won. Mar him. He'll have a scar he can see, all because of you. And your mother, the only woman you ever cried for, must tend to it as a bride tends to her vows, forsaking all others, no matter how sore the injury. No matter how sore the injury has left you, you sit understanding yourself as a human being, finally free now that nobody's got to love you. 